for joining us today. My name is uh, Daniel Jimenez. I'm the leader of the community of practice on data-driven agronomy. I'm pleased to see you all attending on our Wednesday morning here in Colombia and Mexico. So welcome to the first out of four webinars that we are organizing on the topic ingredients of scaling. So one of the objectives of the community of practice on data-driven agronomy is communicate uh, um, collective action on a particular topic across the CGIR or beyond the CGIR on big data, um, with our partners. And that is precisely what we want to do today in this webinar. So bringing virtually colleagues, colleagues to share their experiences on, uh, on scaling their different projects in, in different geographies. Um, I have just one question for all of us, and we were getting messages on, on, on our window, on our window shot. So, but can anyone, can everyone hear us and, 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 and see that? If there's someone that cannot see us or hear us, please let us know, okay? Good, loud and clear, I'm reading. Great. So, a little bit of background on the idea of this webinar is that on considering the topic for this webinar is it started last year when we had a session on a, our big data convention in India. Uh, and we run also a blog contest on the topic on digital extension and we realized how researchers across the CGI are uh, working on research for development struggle uh, to scale out uh, some of our projects. So it seems that many of us working on that, uh, at some point, have we been frustrated uh, when we see that we have a great initiative, a great initiative that we started with solid science behind, with farmers already engaged, and then for some reason it stops because we don't have more funding, there is no involvement of people that can provide financial sustainability, uh, no, good, uh, no good business planning. So it basically never got to the scale uh, it was intended. But as this is not the space to share my, my uh, personal mm -hmm. frustrations, so better to listen to the people that can give us some uh, hope on this. So for this webinar, um, entitled The Meaningful of, of Scaling, The What and Why, where we have two presentations, 15 minutes each, uh, and then we will have a wrap up and Q&A um, session. The first presenter is Leonard Watering from the International Maze and Wheat Improvement Center. Uh, he's a scaling catalyst. He will he talk about why we should move from scaling from scaling more to a more meaningful way of scaling that integrates sustainability, systems change, and responsible scaling. And then we will have Diana Giraldo, a researcher from at the Alliance of Biodiversity International and, and, and CF and the University of Reading. And she will present an example of meaningful scaling of technical agroclimatic committees to 10 countries in Latin America in a sustainable way. So let's get started and I'll hand over uh, to Leonard now. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, um, Daniel. And thank you so much for the, um, this opportunity to, to speak at this very big platform. I saw that you have 230 uh, uh, people participating or at least um, um, yeah, registering. Um, I'm uh, Leonard Voltering. I work for CIMIT. I'm also the chair of the of the another community of practice uh, working group on scaling. So this really um, started, um, let's say, a few years ago when Larry Cooley and Johannes Lin, I think the godfathers of scaling, I think people that know the literature, they said there are so many organizations that are struggling with this. Let's let's have a group around this so that we can um, so that we can work on this. Um, and they started this community of practice and we have uh, quite a lot few members now uh, a few hundreds not as big as the big data platform but I think we're, we're slowly getting there and I'm very happy that we are joining the two groups are you seeing my right the the screen properly or do you see the the moderation screen Daniel is it okay if not I just I can see it, it all right excellent you, Thanks. See the moderation. Samples, uh, you see the moderation screen okay. yeah let me uh, let me shift to the other screen. Um, better? Perfect, Leonard. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. 
So scaling, the dominant use of scaling, and I think you all recognize this, is that we have a, a continuum of a discovery. And since I'm working for SIMIT, we might as well talk about the discovery of a maize seed, right? Then we move to a proof of concept. So we try it out in our center and say, okay, this is a fantastic variety. Then we do piloting, and then we take some of those seeds to, uh, to villages around. And then the next obvious step is scaling, right? That's how we design the things. But we realize actually that the steps between discovery, proof of concept, proof of concept and piloting are pretty obvious. And we know how to do it well. But if we move from piloting to scaling, there's a very big black box of, of assumptions and really not really knowing what's going on. And it's not only us. It turns out that it's a kind of like the whole world is struggling with this in urban planning, in health, in education, and in basically every sector. Scaling is a big thing. And people say, you know, the pilots, they never fail. They're great. But the pilots also never scale. And never means uh, kind of like 95% of the cases, things don't really scale to a level that we intend to or think we think they can scale to. Right? And I just want to talk to you about two major problems. And, and this presentation is really a primer for the series of webinars that we have in store for you on the science of scaling, on the art of scaling, and more on the practice of scaling, really live examples. These are a series of webinars. And this is really to kind of like prime you to ask the, the pertinent questions in those kind of uh, discussions. And also maybe in your institute or where you work to be the kind of like the, 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 the nagging person asking them uh, the nagging questions, right? So the first one, the first major problem is this pilot versus the real world environment. And the second major problem around this is the tension between two scaling paradigms. And I'll just go into those now. So the first one, most pilot projects are really operated in very controlled environments. They have very strong leadership. Mostly they have projects coming in with external experts, highly paid international experts. They set up their own camps, let's say, often in parallel to the local system. They support partnerships. They provide a lot of incentives for people to partner value chain actors to participate and of course they rely on unsustainable grounds with a fixed starting time and a fixed end time right and maybe more importantly they're all shielded from politics from market forces um, etc so it's kind of like operating in a, in a in a glass house right and there are two common strategies how we go to scale how we go from that pilot environment, the controlled pilot environment, let's say the greenhouse, to, to scale. And these are arguments that you can win tenders with and proposals with, and you can convince donors. If you say these things, you probably get the funding that you want, right? The first one, you just do a bigger project, right? You make a bigger um, glass house. Or well, the second is you say, well, our innovation is so great, it will scale from itself. No need to do much more. We basically just remove the, the glass house and we go into the real world. Now, what we've learned is that a successful pilot is no guarantee for a success at scale at all. You cannot just extrapolate what happens in a pilot project to the real world at scale. You just push with your existing model a bit harder, things will not go better, right? Or at a, it will also work at the other scale and in other locations. Major reason is that impact at scale requires very different skills, very different approaches, and very different ways of collaboration. And this is really where the gist of the scaling is. And this is what the webinars are all about. What different skills, what different approaches, what different ways of collaboration. It's kind of like, I'd like to explain this a little bit with an example of a lady on a bicycle. And maybe from my accent, you heard I'm from the Netherlands. And this lady happens to be the queen of the Netherlands. I don't know if there are royalists among us. We have 230 participants. There should be a, at least a few fans. So she's very happy on her bike. She's riding on even on the grass there, no problem. And she can take a few more people on board, right? Maybe three more and, and some groceries. But if she really wants to, to scale more, 
she probably has to get a driver's license, move from the bicycle lane to the road, learn how to drive properly, and then you can take many more people. Then, of course, you get into your limitations of what you can carry with that, with that car, right? And then you need to move, okay, maybe I need to buy a bus and, or get a bus and get a bus driver's license, get acquainted with how the rules and regulations of those bus stops to get more people on board. And then you can go and again to another limitation. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that innovation, they respond to new system dynamics at different levels. So this bicycle might work well, but you cannot have a bicycle that, that can, can carry as many people as the bus can, right? So you need to change models. You need to change also the way that you work. You need a driver's license. You need to other things that uh, can, can enable you to, to basically um, carry that capacity, carry that scale. And another very important thing is that context is king. And this is true for both environments, both in the pilot environment, basically the environment where you test the things, the fact that the thing is so successful as you think it is, or you basically prove it is in your evidence, is also because of that context. In many cases, we also test our innovations with lead farmers or richer farmers. There's a lot of documentation about this, that in many cases we're actually not spreading or are trying to to create the impact with the kind of uh, target beneficiaries as we call them uh, that we're actually uh, uh, aiming for because we're looking at different kind of dynamics right so the same is true in the real world the context is going to be king so the innovation is part or the technology is part of a social system that basically determines if it works or not so one important learning from, the, from this is that you never get into the, in the glass house. It's way too comfortable. So really try to scale, or try to pilot things in as much as a real world environment as you can. The second thing is a tension between paradigms. And I think you all, maybe you all used it, myself included. If you put the word scaling, people say, ah, oh, this is going to be great. It's going to be bigger. It's going to be better. It's like a magical word, right? But we have to be very careful because we don't want to raise expectations that we're not meeting. We have to be honest about what we can and what we cannot do. So a thing is what, is, what is important is that one of the first paradigms, and this is definitely the most dominant one, and this is the tail on the left side of the spectrum, is the, the commercial paradigm. And this ideas of scaling, basically we borrow them from the industrial revolution, from the um, startup growth here in the nearby in California and in Silicon Valley, growth, 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 and more is better. So this is a paradigm, very strong paradigm about scaling. Very uh, logistically focused, right? How do you get this thing out? How do we scale this to as many people as possible? Now, there's more and more uh, voices out there saying, well, maybe this doesn't really fit to us. Us, I'm talking about an organization like CIMIT. It's a publicly funded research institute for the, for the poor. It has a very social, um, uh, very social objective. We are a public institute. So, maybe we should really focus more on the social impact and, and around SDGs. So we should really focus on scaling the positive impact that the innovation creates for people and the environment, not, not only people, but also the environment. So it's not so much about the innovation anymore. It's not so much about the innovation program or scaling the program, scaling the project, because they may not always be good for the people or for the environment. And this is a very interesting uh, book that I recommend here on the site, Scaling Impact. The next webinar will be organized by, by them. So also stick, uh, come join that one. On those two different views, so the one, let's put the fist there, like an innovation push, we're pushing the innovation uh, into a system. We want to sell as many bottles of Coca-Cola as possible, right? So it's very oriented towards outputs and solving barriers for end user adoption. So make sure that people, we could say the enabling environment, create an enabling environment so that Coca-Cola can be bought, right? 
The other one, the systems pool on the other side of the spectrum is very much looking at organizational and institutional dynamics to that obstruct basically the outcome. So what you want to achieve, let's say the poverty, et cetera. So it's not so much anymore about this particular innovation, but about the outcome that you're trying to reach. And I think we're all familiar with the way that we do our theories of change, et cetera. The innovation push, basically you get away with a very simple, um, a linear way of, of, of saying, okay, well, if you do this intervention, then you have this change and then you have this outcome. But the reality is, of course, and that, that's kind of what you, what you do in the system change and uh, system thinking uh, schools, is say, well, we are aware that it is a very complex thing and the, our intervention is a, a piece of a, of a much bigger puzzle of which we don't even know more than half of the things that are going on. In the end, if the outcome happens, it's very difficult to say if it's basically due to our, our intervention, right? So it's kind of like a perfect storm of things coming together, which we don't even have influence on, that basically make that change. The innovation push is very focused on beneficiaries or end users adopting. And the other one is very much about incentives for all the actors, political level, uh, value chain actors to say, well, this is a great thing. This is a great thing that we want to support. Um, more is better, and here it's very much about responsible scaling. And I just want to say a word about this. I'm, I'm really happy that this isn't getting more attention also. I mean, especially in agriculture, if you look at uh, scaling and if you look at the effects, for example, fertilizer use, the effects on the environment, irrigation, water, irrigation is the biggest water user, fresh water user in, in the world. There are limitations to what we think should be done, right? There's limitations to growth. And this is very true for, for agriculture. So there's a responsible scaling, looks a little bit at, okay, do no harm. Uh, also socially, leave no one behind. Are we not basically kicking women out of the markets, for example, or are we giving them more work, etc.? So scaling should be responsible. More is not always better. And what you see as a, as a result of those two models, um, these are the two extremes, right? So I'm, I'm really pushing it to the left. Well, this innovation push has resulted a lot in piecemeal innovation and impact during the project lifetime. So a lot of project, great impact during the project lifetime, then it, it goes down quickly, right? The other problem with the system is that it's very difficult to say, okay, did we actually do something, right? So somewhere in the middle. So are they two different views? And what happens is in many projects, you start with, okay, we have this fantastic innovation, let's get this to scale. And we push it, we push it, and then we realize, hey, we're actually part of a system. How do we actually make the system absorb this kind of innovation or even other innovations that might be just doing the same thing as we are trying to do? So they're not that, that uh, separate from each other. There are, there are the tensions between the two. And that basically determines how far do you want to be? Do you want to be on the innovation push or do you want to be on the, on the system pool? And one of the tensions is, okay, what can you do as an organization, right? What is within your sphere of control? What is within your sphere of influence? And what is within your sphere, sphere of interest, right? Not all organizations are fit to take the whole system, uh, to tackle the basically all systemic issues, right? Maybe a, Another very big issue, and this is a discussion you will always have if you talk about scaling, is about attribution and contribution. Are you willing to basically let go of that uh, idea of, okay, the attribution that I did this, and that's why this is a great result? Or do we understand, okay, we are part of a much bigger thing, and we are basically external people intervening into local systems often, and the most we can do is contribution. And this flows into the next issue, uh, the challenge really is, okay, what is success? And, and how do you monitor that? How do you, how do you prove to your donors or to, to your constituents that you did something useful, right? And lastly is the local organizational and institutional capacities. A lot of the, um, the issues around scaling really depend on the local ownership and really playing as, a, as an internal international organization or as an external organization um, more like a catalyst or a facilitator of processes and not doing stuff for them and, and okay, handing it over to them like, okay, now it's your turn. Uh, it's really about local capacity to, to take this forward. 
So yeah, I, I kind of feel like we're, we are not at that tipping point yet. We're still very comfortable in, in pushing innovations. A lot of organizations are climbing that hill, but it's very difficult to really embrace that, that system view and, uh, and really go over that topping point and, and really have a very different perspective on, on international development and how we can play a role in that. The good news, scaling is a thing. I think um, if you would ask maybe gender specialist 50 years ago, okay, well, would you like to be a gender expert in this uh, organization? People would say no, because you know, everybody does gender. We involve women. We also train women, of course, right? 20 years ago, M&E. Of course, everybody is doing M&E. Now we have M&E experts, right? And I see the same going on with, with scaling. Scaling is something that has to be taken seriously in its own right. And it, it, it is. So that, that's very good. In the last 10, 20 years, you see a much more clarity on unpacking this, this black box. Very much, very many developments on the science of scaling. And this is, of course, a bridge to the next webinar in, in August where um, uh, IITA and IRD, uh, IDRC are going to talk about the science of scaling. Much more conceptual clarity also on things like responsible scaling, sustainability, system change within, within scaling. Another thing which has been really picking up in the last uh, 10 years are the communities of practice. Communities of practice of scaling itself has been growing a lot. The interest from, for example, the big data in scaling, this is really great development. Many organizations are having their scaling units now slowly or scaling doctors to support different projects. Um, and you see a lot of tools coming up and tools especially designed to facilitate discussion with local actors about what scaling is and what it takes to, to, to do it and what, what it involves. And last but not least, um, you also see a move in funding and also in implementation of, of, of scaling. And if you read, for example, the, um, the tender documents of, of Skoll Foundation or Co-Impact, they're very focused on scaling with a very strong system, system view in that. It's very great to read that. Also implement the CRS, for example, taking scaling very seriously now. SNV, the Netherlands, for example, they, they said, okay, well, we're not going to count farmers anymore. Well, we're going to still count farmers, but we're going to do something more. We define success if other financial uh, resources are leveraged. When we kickstart markets that are sustaining themselves. When governments are basically adopting our approaches. And when we change the new normal. This is success for, for SMV. For example, you see this with other organizations. Sahel Consulting, also very interesting approaches. And they really focus on the scaling in a more meaningful way of scaling. Takeaways, so scaling approaches high adoption, like the simple definition of it, basically leads to piecemeal innovation. You have maybe an improvement somewhere here and this unsustainable impact mostly goes away very quickly. So there's a really a need to shift to a more meaningful scaling, which where innovations are the means to an end and not the end in itself. And we also have to go beyond reaching many, as always this, this key metric of success, and be guided by principles of sustainability, system change, and also very strongly responsible scaling. And to me, it sounds a little bit like, okay, we all have this in our vision and mission statement. We all want to end poverty. We are on a food insecurity, etc. Let's say that's the moon, but we're still kind of driving the car, no? We're not really going, picking up from earth, because we're still focused so much on these, uh, let's say, farmer beneficiaries, counting them and seeing what they're doing, uh, and not seeing that amount of farmers as a result of the other kind of work that you're doing, the system work that you're doing. So another two last points, don't just pilot the innovation, but really pilot the scaling. So really see scaling as something that you need to pilot. How can you uh, design stuff in a way, the project in a way, that um, uh, when the project ends, the thing continues to grow even faster than, 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 than without you, right? Um, how can you ensure that people don't, the project doesn't stop because of funding stops, but how can you incorporate, for example, uh, accessing market finance for those uh, projects and local actors to continue what they're doing? 
there's a major challenge, like I said, about evidence for sustainable change at scale. And I think that's holding back a little bit uh, organizations moving to that side of the spectrum. And maybe this is something where the big data platform people can contribute. Um, and that's maybe something for the discussion part. So I feel that we're, we're kind of like reaching a, a very nice place where we want to be, a very healthy place of development but we still have to struggle a bit through the jungle, cut, the, cut our way through the jungle to, to get there. So yeah, thank you so much for your interest. This is the last slide. Again, the science of scaling, uh, next webinar is on the 25th of August. You're happily invited to join our community of practice. Um, please email me and we're also active on Twitter. I just wanna to refer to two documents here. There are many things that I refer to, uh, but I think this is a very interesting one. Uh, a good starter kit is the scale up source book. There's a link, and this article describes a little bit what I what I do here in the, in the presentation. So thank you so much, and I'm I'm handing over to uh, to Daniel. Thank you so much. Hi, Leonard. Thank you so much. Very interesting presentation. I think, Diana, uh, we will head right to you now for your presentation. You're on mute, Diana. Yes, let me share the screen. Thank you. Okay, can you see my screen? Perfect. Perfect, thanks Maria Camila. I'm very happy to be here to tell you about our work in connecting climate information with the agricultural sector for decision making through the Technical Agroclimatical Committees, MTAs, and the Participatory Integrate Climate Services for Agriculture in Latin America, where the farmer's engagement is the paramount for climate service success. But why do I mention our work? Because in eight years of working in climate services for agriculture, there are more than 260 institutions involving in the technical agroclimatical committees in Latin America. Uh, how mentioned uh, Leonard is the MTAs is like uh, the tandem concept. Uh, imagine that you are riding a tandem bicycle. This requires coordination, collaboration, and communication between the riders to get to their destination. In the same way, uh, to embed the MTAs within the institutional and decision context for long-term sustainability requires key indicators. But uh, let me begin by explaining what an, the Technical Agroclimatical Committees is. MTA is a dialogue process among a diversity of local institutions, a public and private sector, government, NGOs, researchers, extension services, and farmers seeking to understand the expected changes in the climate of the regions how can affect uh, their crops and what they can do to reduce the negative impacts. This dialogue is used to generate an agroclimatical bulletin where, for example, the agricultural agents are benefiting for better understanding and through contributing to the translation of climate information into concrete agricultural recommendations. In more details, during each meeting or committee, uh, the agrometeorology teams, uh, these teams involve meteorologists of the National and Meteorological Service and agricultural researchers working together to share the agroclimatical forecast. Uh, then the MTA stakeholders meet in groups to analyze how crops will be affected based on the forecast presented, uh, their own experience and knowledge to make recommendations that facilitated decision making according to the climate conditions foreseen for the following months. For example, in Honduras, uh, in Central America, the committees are every three months in Colombia every month, 
And this depends on the context. Um, in other words, uh, means that the MTAs is not an extrapolated uh, linear approach. Uh, each MTAs is built and adapted to the context of each territory. Uh, this graph uh, shows the timeline and the most relevant milestone of the agroclimatical technical committees born as a pilot in 2013, becoming a successful transition from pilot to a scale. To um, summarize a long story, I'd like to point out uh, two interesting details. Uh, first, uh, the South-South exchange between Colombia and Honduras to Senegal to witness innovative participatory approaches to bring seasonal climate forecasts to farmers for better agricultural management. As a result for this exchange, a project with the Ministry of Agriculture for the implementation of three MTAs in Colombia as a pilot. So, uh, for three years of building this approach, uh, CCAF empowers national institutions to lead and sustain the process. It is when in 2015, the MTAs become a commitment of the country in the national determinate contributions. Uh, the second point is that MTAs start to scale in a top-down approach in Honduras. But, uh, however, our questions was whether the farmers use the climate information provided to them, and, is, and if yes, how? We realized that there is a gap between climate information, knowledge, and is used by farmers. And for this reason, uh, we started working a bottom-up approach with the farmers. This map uh, shows uh, the location of the 35 MTAs in 10 countries, where through monitoring process have resulted in more than 330,000 farmers being able to access agroclimatic information to support planning and decision making in their crops. To sum up, uh, the agroclimatical technical committees, the NTA's approach, has the necessary ingredients to provide climate services for agriculture as a system uh, that is sustainable and scalable. Uh, ingredients uh, such as uh, structure and government of the NTA's, resources, communication, collaboration, and most importantly, connected to the local needs and requirements in the territories. I'd like to emphasize uh, that a concern with the concept of demand-driven services is that it might be uh, too narrow because farmers are not always aware of the new technologies, innovations, or new knowledge that they could demand. For this, uh, the MTAs and PICS approach helps to uh, build capacities to stimulate the farmers to consider a good decision making, implementing a range of innovations using an interface between uh, the farmers and the station agents or local institutions. Because it's important because this involves uh, much more than the provide information. There are other elements in a farmer's decision maker, maker uh, making to consider. And I agree with uh, Leonard, <laughs> it's not just uh, reaching numbers. We should consider the three dimensions, uh, the scale, sustain sustainability, and the system change. Um, my next slides uh, describe how the MTAs uh, transform the system with some example in four areas. After conducting the outcome harvesting, uh, 140 changes were identified as a result of the MTA's implementation. Uh, here are a summary of the most relevant, and you can find more information on this link, it's a working paper. 
Um, the transformation area one is the information is known, understandable, and connected through the MTAs, where the confidence of the stakeholders, organization, and farmers in local climate information has been strengthened, leading to better integration in the decision-making process. Also, uh, the IRI, the International Research Institute for Climate and Society in New York, work in enhancing the skills of the meteorological services where the MTAs are implemented. The second um, transformation area is the national and institutional policy changes. The, here, there are three relevant uh, milestones. Uh, first is the MTAs are part of the NDCs in Colombia. Honduras uh, signed a ministerial agreement for the MTA establishment. And now MTAs as part of the regional strategy for disaster risk management in the agricultural sector and food and nutrition security in Latin America and the Caribbean. The next transformation area is knowledge democratizations with the MTA participants uh, with the farmer groups that involve uh, participatory decision-making tools. Uh, the farmers decide under the context how best to manage their crops, consider agroclimatic information in a co-learning process. In other words, uh, to build capacities to stimulate if farmers consider uh, and then implement a range of innovation uh, using a sustainable interface between the all um, MTA participants. Um, finally, uh, the transformation area four is changes in productive practices uh, involve the farmer's decision made after participating in MTAs and PIXA process, uh, changing the planting day, uh, showing a new variety or diversify, uh, changing the scale or their crops, reduce or change inputs for pest and disease management, water management, among other uh, practices. And here uh, are two case studies, uh, well documented, uh, that result in avoided economic losses in rice. And the other case studies is an increase uh, in bean yield. However, in eight years of MTA's implementations, uh, we have many lessons learned and challenge uh, we face. Uh, the first is the time horizons. Um, some MTAs uh, in one or two countries are sustained through a pilot project, do not mature. And when the project ends or the government changes, we have problems with the sustainability of the MTAs. Uh, also, the turnover of personnel in institutions, especially in the meteorological services, is high, which makes a process of skill development very difficult. The other challenge is uh, gender. Um, remember that the agroclimatical technical committees is an inclusive open space where everyone can participate. Indeed, in some MTAs, uh, most participants are women. Uh, however, we need to pay more attention in some, um, in some uh, social difference, such as gender, uh, pay attention in the roles, uh, responsibilities, and daily activities carried out, but women and men because they have different needs and access and response to climate information. The other challenge, um, this is uh, amazing because uh, youth participation in the MTAs and their engagement with the ICTs has been fascinated. Uh, the youth uh, design the agroclimatical bulletins, create training space beyond the MTAs, 
on topics of interest as uh, such um, crop models or analyze climate information. And the other thing as the young people that participated in the MTAs transfer the agroclimatical bulletin in short audios or infographies or videos. However, most uh, rural households um, don't have access to the internet, you know, and this is evident now with the COVID-19, where many children don't have access to computer or connection to take their virtual classes. For this, um, I think that the benefits of public and private partnerships could be a good option to explore in the MTA's uh, approach. Um, while MTAs carry two evaluation process through an outcome harvesting approach, uh, also monitoring through surveys at the end of the age MTA meeting. Uh, monitoring and evaluation is complex. It uh, requires time and resources that the MTA's leading institution don't consider. And finally, uh, the challenge at uh, the first mile. <laughs> um, the farmers must not be considered merely to be passive recipient of information, products or service development. The climate service must fit their context and need farmers need working as a system. It's important, it's not follow a um, linear uh, approach. Um, we need to consider the linkages, the feedback and include a continuous knowledge exchange and learning. For this, it's relevant to work with farmers in a parallel process to support decision making based on agroclimatical information provided for the MTAs. And this is my two slides. Uh, the pictures illustrated some of the activities that are carried in the MTAs uh, meetings. Uh, we have a step-by-step -step manual in Spanish, in English, that guides the process of implementing an MTAs. And uh, here is the para parallel process that I mentioned, carried out by the MTA institution with their farmers, implementing participatory integrate process, uh, such as the PICS approach, Excise participatory integrate climate services for agriculture to connect the agroclimatical information from the MTA with the farmer's decision making context. Um, this is my presentation. Thanks for listening and happy to answer your questions and, of course, receive your feedback. More information in the links uh, of this presentation of the web. There are blogs, videos, testimonial, case study, and of course in the Twitter, or you can send me an email. Thanks. Thank you, Diana. And thank you, Leonard, also for introducing us to your work. So I see we have some questions already, so let's start. Um, so first question we have is for Leonard. So question from Ollie at G-A-I-N. How do you think we find the balance between scaling innovations after successful pilots versus piloting further new innovations? It seems important that people in innovation roles continue to focus on experimentation, but we don't want pilots to become one-offs with no long-term benefit. Yeah, thank you so much. This is Perfect. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and I think it, it comes back to the role. As an innovator, if you, if you come up, for example, with a typewriter now, you have a fun sorry, yeah, sorry, I have my, my videos on now. Yeah, good question. Um, I think we have to see, okay, what is the distinction between the roles? Roles as an innovator and, and, some, and coming up with innovations that are basically ready to scale, that can go to scale. If, you could come, if you're innovating now and coming up with a great typewriter, uh, it probably is not very scalable now because everybody's using uh, using computers. So there's one thing, okay, researchers should be in their lab and do their experimentation, and, but also I think you should also look at really what is required, what is the demand, right? So 
this is a very blunt example, but in terms of scaling, it really comes down to yeah, what actually do you want to um, what do you want to uh, achieve, and um, um, uh, uh, there is of course the um, uh, wait, I'm, I'm losing my train of of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of thought here. Um, um, there's there's a role for an experimenting to do your experimentation to get something good, right? But what we're saying is that the scalability of something doesn't really depend only on the innovation itself. The innovation alone is not enough. You need to have something that can work in the basically the environment that you that you design it for. And to do that, you need to collaborate with many other people, many other disciplines that are part of that. So in doing that, you really need to team up with social scientists, with other kind of scientists to understand much more what is actually required and how can you develop something that is kind of scalable, right? So that, that's, I think, an important point. Another thing is very much about collaboration. And I think I saw another question. Maybe I jump straight to the next question because I think it's linked. Is how do you, uh, do you start with this innovation push or do you go to that system um, uh, view? I think it's a kind of like a hybrid, right? And it depends on what your strength is. It's important to keep your strength. If your strength is in finding out if an innovation is really working well, that is important because you need to convince others with, for example, strong data that, okay, your yield goes up with this, or the taste is better, or something else. The thing is that it's not enough for scaling. And I think a lot of people make that wrong assumption, say, well, it's fantastic, look at the results, now it's ready to scale. This is one piece of the puzzle. It's an important piece of the puzzle, and it's work that should continue, but it's definitely not enough. So you need to understand much more the environment. And many of our organizations, where we all work in, are basically geared to come up with one trick, like one innovation, you know, one kind of type of innovation. CGR is very strongly crop focused, right? That's we do some very well, but we need to collaborate with others to really bring it to scale and really define what is actually the scale that we want. Right? Thank you, Leonard. We have a question for Diana. This is a question from Annette. So how are the MTAs governed? Are they decentralized? How are they funded? Okay, thanks uh, for the questions. Uh, yes, in some uh, contexts uh, in Central America, um, Honduras and Colombia, um, is in Honduras, it's a top-down approach, is government with the Ministry of Agriculture in Colombia too, is centralizing, but this does not mean that the MTAs follow the uh, own approach is the uh, following uh, the or adapted to the context. This is important. And yes, in Colombia and Honduras, is a government and the structure is uh, follow the Ministry of Agriculture that implement uh, these MTAs and support with the resource uh, the sustain of the of the MTAs. In other contexts depend of the projects, uh, depend of the local governments. Uh, this is the, not a good way because the project ends uh, and of course the problems with the sustainability of the MTAs. And the, in other contexts in South America, uh, the MTAs in Paraguay, in Ecuador and Chile, uh, the MTAs is sustained by um, a project, a big project that uh, carry out the different uh, results or uh, agenda of the different countries. Thank you, Diana. Next question is for Leonard. So from Apurva, when a systems approach is used for designing a program, what approaches would you recommend for measuring and monitoring impact? Well, this is uh, really the Achilles heel, I think, the weak spot of the, um, the system, the system view. And, and uh, I think this is basically the major reason why we are very comfortable on that side of the spectrum where we basically count farmers using or adopting an innovation is because it's very difficult to measure what system change is and what do we mean with it or how sustainable is it? Sustainability you can only measure basically after the project is, is over, which is very difficult. Donors don't like to pay for those kind of projects where you say, well, 
we don't know the project the 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 impact will be will be later so this is to me if there's a smart person on this call and i'm sure there are this is really the, the key issue there are some um, approaches which i think very promising and diana showed one uh, used one is this outcome harvesting where you really go beyond uh, the numbers and you really look at what kind of changes have actually taken place and not changes within the project but what changes have happened that people are going to do irrespective of the project irrespective of you because they think this is a good thing and i'm going to do it in my next project i'm going to do it in my personal life another strong movement coming up is this blue marble innovation i suggest that you look at it they have a very nice community of practice where they also see the blue marble is the idea of you look from the space to the earth and you only see a blue marble right so there are no boundaries basically you have a very system view these are uh, methods that are really coming up strongly and i think they're very promising but they're not used much yet i think diana gave a great example of how you can use them these are i think interesting things but it is to me that's why i think we're in the jungle we're still cutting our way through the forest because we don't have a, a lot of convincing data to show just the way that we show this is adopted and that is not adopted which is also uh, up for discussion of course we don't have a way to say, okay, this is a system change and there is not a system change. So it's still a bit fluffy, but we are getting there. And I think in 10 years from now, we look back at this and we, we laugh about this discussion. Probably. Thank you, Leonard. So we have a lots of questions and little time, unfortunately. So I'm going to just wrap up with a couple of more questions and then we'll pass the ball to Daniel to do the wrap up and we will eventually get all the answers to you. We're so sorry. Um, but we'll ask some a couple more questions and so we can continue so this one is for leonard from mira could you please explain how best pilot the scaling should be implemented when working in a research project example restoration of degraded land and test it if we don't control other factors yeah that's a, that's a, that's a good question and i think the first thing is that you have to be clear with your team and with your stakeholders what actually is the scale that we want to achieve what is scale is it entire tunisia is it entire uh, northern africa are we talking about a few localities um, are we talking about millions of farmers are we talking about the hundred thousand farmers and i think once you have to have that discussion you can reverse back kind of okay let, if we want to have this operational in 10 years from now in five years from now what do we need to do now to prepare the local stakeholders to keep on doing that? Because we are, we can push it now, but we're not going to be there forever, right? And the really scaling takes place after the project, when the things are really developing from themselves with other initiatives coming together. Many things in most of the projects where we, we try to look at this, finance is a major issue. Most of us in our researchers in agricultural research, we don't know much about finance, but it's a key issue for local stakeholders and for scaling. But we basically say, well, this is for somebody else, right? Business, business models is another key issue that we tend not to look so much at. Why would somebody provide those seeds of those forages uh, to those farmers in these far off villages? Well, because we pay them project money to do that, right? Would they do it also without the project money? So th you can pilot that. Pilot a model within your project. How can you find it, for example, those providers, seed providers, to do that kind of service without external funding or funding from other sources or something that they can do? So these are kind of things. Reverse back, where do you want to go? Do you have to, uh, what do you need at that last day so that you can basically say, well, on the 31st of December, I'm out, guys. And then the things will, will go on. So reverse engineer, but very have a very clear ambition of what what the scale is and have that discussed also with the local stakeholders and come up with a realistic uh, scaling ambition is, is a key step perfect thank you leonard so i see we have lots of questions and we will save these and we will get back to you we will review them with our speakers and we will definitely get back to you and but thank you all for writing down your questions i just want to clear have something cleared up for everyone so remember the link to the recording will be shared through our social media channel